Droughts cause major food losses around the world. Climate change only makes this situation worse. One of our strategies is to identify plants that tolerate periods of drought and recover when they have access to water again. Scientists are racing to find solutions, but first, there are questions to be answered. Amaranth is proposed to be a water stress resistant plant. The question is, how resistant is it? Can it tolerate drought? Amaranth has shown a formidable tolerance to water stress, but we have not yet explored its full potential. However, things don't always go as planned. Stressed plants are at a point of no return. It is possible that if they are not watered today, they may die. We believe the key is the amaranth leaf cells and crystals. Researchers delve into the leaf in search of answers. These slices are 500 nanometers thick, allowing us to evaluate the morphology of a single cell layer. Will the amaranth plant hold the keys to coping with drought? Potosí, in central Mexico, is the Potosí Institute of Scientific and Technological Research, where a group of researchers is working on solutions to cope with droughts. We are a public scientific and technological research center that seeks solutions to problems that afflict our country such as drought. Droughts have worsened in recent years and particularly in this year 2022, affecting society and the fields that produce our food. In multiple greenhouses and laboratories, researchers grow and study plants to understand how they can tolerate the lack of water, the so-called water stress. One of the plants we have identified is amaranth. In addition to being drought tolerant, it has great nutritional and cultural value. Amaranth seed has been consumed in Mexico since pre-Hispanic times and is now considered a superfood. We want to identify the molecular and cellular mechanisms that allow drought tolerance in order to apply this knowledge to other food crops. But what are the molecular and cellular mechanisms for surviving drought? Scientists believe the molecular key is calcium oxalate. Calcium oxalate is a molecule composed of carbon, oxygen, and calcium. Some plants accumulate it in their leaves in the form of crystals. Plants need carbon to live, which they normally obtain from carbon dioxide in the air, which enters the leaves through the stomata. Once inside, carbon dioxide is fixed through photosynthesis. Stomata are gates located in the epidermis of the leaves. These gates expand or contract to allow or block the passage of gases between the inside and outside of the leaf. Through the stomata, the plant also loses water through transpiration, so in water stress the stomata are closed to save water, but at the same time carbon is prevented from entering the leaf. If the stomata are closed, the plant will not have access to carbon from the air. There will be no carbon fixation and its growth will be compromised. In a previous water stress experiment in amaranth, we observed that the plant continued to grow while its oxalate content decreased. Since the stomata were closed, we believe that the plant used the carbon in the oxalate crystals to continue growing. If so, we hypothesize that if we subject an amaranth plant to water stress, the amount and size of its crystals will decrease or even disappear. If this hypothesis is true, oxalate crystals would represent a vast store of carbon, 
which would allow the plant to grow when the stomata are closed. However, not everyone agrees. The proposal is very interesting, and the finding would have important implications for plant physiology. However, the experiment is open to criticism. Since the plants were subjected to a very severe stress condition, this now invites us to think about whether the process the plants are facing is one of cell adaptation or cell death. Yes, the stress suffered by the plants was important, but I do not believe that they were dead. In addition, the amaranth leaf has an anatomy that would allow its cells to adapt to water scarcity rather than die. Despite the criticisms, the researchers want to test their hypothesis and are proposing a new experiment. These are the facilities where we will carry out the development of our experiment. This greenhouse has an automatic temperature and humidity control, which ensures a good development of our plants. For the development of our experiment, we will only include one species of amaranth, which is Amaranthus cruentus variety amarantica. Over 70 plants are grown in the greenhouse for 40 days under optimal care. For the development, what we need is that the plant has a minimum size of 30 centimeters and is randomly arranged. We will have three groups. One will be the control group, one will be the stress group, and the other will be an innovative group, the recovery group. The control group will have routine irrigation throughout the experiment, while the stress group will have irrigation permanently suspended. The recovery group will have irrigation suspended until severe water stress is reached. Irrigation will then be resumed to see if the plant can recover. The researchers want to test the amaranth's ability to tolerate water stress and analyze whether crystals and leaf cells are involved. One of the constant monitoring for the development of our experiment is the measurement of relative humidity in the soil of the plant. For this we rely on some laboratory equipment to make the measurements. 6. It's day zero. The plants in the stress and recovery group received their last watering today. How long will they be able to tolerate the lack of water? In the meantime, new doubts arise about the participation of crystals. If oxalate is used as a carbon source, what happens to the calcium that is released? This question is interesting, because it is known that calcium in excess has a toxic effect on the plant. So far, the scientific community agrees that the main function of the crystals is to trap free calcium in the plant. The researcher's hypothesis therefore contradicts this function to some extent. While it is true that a lot of calcium would be released by utilizing the carbon in the crystals, plants have other mechanisms to deal with it. Oxalate is not the only way. It's day 13. The plants are beginning to show signs of water stress. It is time to start sampling. Today the control group and the stress group are sampled. The plants in the recovery group have not yet reached severe stress. The researchers harvest a leaf from the plant, cut off the middle zone, and fix it in formaldehyde for microscopy studies. The rest of the leaf is frozen in liquid nitrogen for future RNA studies. RNA is a very label molecule, so it can easily degrade and change in response to different external stimuli. That is why we are going to freeze our leaves with liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees Celsius to stop all metabolic activity and preserve this molecule. Proteins as well as RNA are label, that is why we use a chemical fixative to stop all enzymatic activity of the leaves we are going to analyze. 
In this case we do not use liquid nitrogen because the samples are for microscopy and freezing can alter the shape of the tissues. It has been a long day. The researchers and the samples need to rest. The laborious procedure for microscopy analysis begins. The middle zone of the leaf is too large, so a smaller sample must be obtained. The samples will undergo a series of steps, which will gradually remove the water to be replaced by a liquid resin. What cellular changes are being generated by water stress? The leaf remnant will be subjected to an optical clearing process. The crystals are located just in the middle of the thickness of the whole leaf, and both at the top and at the bottom there are cells in air. These two components prevent us from seeing well through the entire thickness of the leaf to make a correct estimation of the crystal. The air is already eliminated in the greenhouse when we collect the leaves, since it is subjected to vacuum during the fixation process. This procedure will make it possible to observe the crystals inside the leaf, in order to analyze whether water stress produces changes in their size or quantity. Now, what we are doing is eliminating the content of the cells that prevent us from seeing well through it to see the crystals. And we are doing this with a treatment based on detergents and urea, which extract these compounds, mainly lipids. Leaves are opaque and light cannot pass through them. Optical clearing converts the opaque leaf into a transparent one. Will the amount of crystals decrease due to water stress? It's day 17. Signs of water stress in plants in the stress and recovery group are severe. However, the researchers insist that the plants can tolerate even more. Today only the control and stress groups are being sampled. The control group continues to be watered routinely, while plants in the recovery group will still not receive water. But what other findings suggest that the crystals may be giving up their carbon to the plant? In the previous experiment, in addition to observing oxalate depletion, we found rubisco around the crystal. Rubisco is the enzyme responsible for fixing carbon from the air. Under normal conditions, it is found only in the chloroplasts of the cell. When a plant cell dies, its components, including chloroplasts, travel to the vacuole to be degraded. It is also in the vacuole that the crystal forms, which may explain why they are observed together in processes of stress or cell death. There are strong questions against the researchers' hypothesis, and now a new one is emerging. Rubisco fixes carbon from carbon dioxide. How could it fix oxalate? We will test for the presence of the enzyme oxalate oxidase in the leaves. This enzyme is capable of decomposing crystals to release carbon dioxide. We hypothesize that we will find it around the crystals, which it would be degrading to feed Rubisco. Meanwhile, the process of replacing water with resin continues. Samples go through a series of dilutions of ethanol in water until pure ethanol is reached. The ethanol will allow the resin to enter all the cells in the sample until they are completely embedded in the resin. 
It's day 19. The signs of water stress in the plants of the stress and recovery group are serious. They have all lost turgor, and some of their leaves have even become brittle. The humidity has dropped from 10 to 2%. We believe that we are at a point where the stressed plants are at a point of no return. It is possible that if they are not watered today, they may die. Everything indicates that the recovery group will no longer be able to recover, thus losing valuable information and time. The control plants still have pretty good turgor. Unlike the leaves of the stressed plant, which have very poor turgor. Despite the discouraging situation, the irrigation of the recovery group is delayed for another day due to planning errors. Meanwhile in the laboratory, the sample water has been replaced by ethanol. Now, the ethanol must be replaced by liquid resin. The samples are quite fragile, so they must be handled very carefully to avoid damaging them. The samples will spend one more night in agitation so that the resin penetrates to the last cell organelle. It's day 21. The day before, irrigation of the recovery group was resumed. It is time to observe whether the plants survived the devastating water stress regime. Surprisingly, some plants have already regained their turgor while others are slowly recovering. To get a more accurate picture of the plant's state of health, the researchers measure photosynthesis. In a chamber with controlled conditions, they measure the amount of light the leaf absorbs, as well as the amount of carbon dioxide it absorbs or expels. The equipment yields three measurements, maximum quantum efficiency of photosystem 2, stomatal conductance, and net carbon assimilation rate. The maximum quantum efficiency of photosystem 2 is a measure of the leaf's ability to absorb sunlight. When the leaf is healthy its value oscillates around 0.8, and it decreases when the leaf is stressed. The maximum efficiency values of photosystem 2 of the plants in the control group and the plants in the recovery group were similar, with an average of 0.6. In the plants of the stress group this parameter was 10 times lower. This is evidence of the strong stress to which the plants were subjected. The recovered plant showed the same capacity to absorb sunlight as the control, while the stressed plant showed 10 times less capacity than the control. What is surprising is the maximum efficiency value of the plants of the recovery group which after 24 hours of being irrigated, reached the level of the plants of the control group. In just one day, the amaranth plant recovered its ability to absorb sunlight after severe water stress. However, what is happening to stomata and carbon flow in the leaf? Stomatal conductance is a measure of the degree of stomata openness. The higher the value, the greater the openness. We found that the stomatal conductance values of the plants in the control group were twice as high as those of the plants in the stress and recovery groups. The control plant has its stomata open to absorb carbon dioxide regardless of water loss, since it has been watered continuously. 
On the contrary, the stressed plant has its stomata more closed to avoid losing the little water it has left. The stomata of the recovered plant remain closed even though it has already received water. This can be explained by the nature of the processes. In the photosystem, the processes are very fast while in the stomata they are processes of turgor change and osmotic potential, which can be slower. Net carbon assimilation rate is a measure of the amount of carbon dioxide the leaf absorbs or expels. If the amount of carbon dioxide absorbed by the leaf is greater than the amount expelled, assimilation is positive and vice versa. In control plants we found positive assimilation values. But in the plants of the stress group and the recovery group we found negative values. To obtain energy, the cell burns nutrients to carbon dioxide, so-called cellular respiration. The cellular machinery of the stressed and recovered plant is too damaged to fix carbon. The cell needs a lot of energy to recover from the damage caused by water stress. That is why it emits more carbon than it can capture. In the laboratory, the ethanol in the samples has been replaced by liquid resin. Now, each sample must be identified and encapsulated with more resin. Finally, the sample is positioned and the resin is solidified in an oven. It's day 36. The plants in the stress group have already been discarded. The plants in the control and recovery groups continue to grow. The researchers repeat the photosynthesis measurement to evaluate the evolution of the recovery process. The maximum efficiency values of photosystem 2 of both control group plants and recovery group plants remain similar at this stage. But the values of stomatal conductance and net assimilation values are now also similar to those of the control group, unlike the previous stage. Plants that suffered severe water stress and were rehydrated now have the same photosynthetic activity as those that never suffered from lack of water. This seems to indicate that the plants have recovered from the water stress to which they were subjected, and it can even be seen that some of them are already flowering and it is possible that they will have seeds. The amaranth plant has shown a formidable tolerance to lack of water. This suggests that it could withstand a drought. However, there are still questions for researchers to address. Now, after surviving the drought, will there be any after effects? And will seed production be modified? Because at the end of the day, yield is important to the farmer. Although amaranth leaves are also edible, the seed is the preferred food of this plant. We are going to let the plants finish growing and let their seeds fully mature to harvest them and measure the production of the recovery group against the control group. The resin has polymerized. 
Now all the cells of the sample are embedded in a rigid support, which will allow very thin slices to be made to examine their interior. It is time to prepare the slides to receive the fragile cuts. It's day 45. The control and recovery plants continue to grow and their seeds are maturing. Here are our control plants. Then our recovery plants. The control plant was constantly watered and fertilized. It has its panicle in seed production. Its leaves are turgid, strong and very large. Unlike other leaves that are naturally shedding, the control plant shows normal development, but how did the recovered plant develop? The plant subjected to severe water stress presented several changes with respect to the control plants. It had a reduction in its size, decrease in the size of its panicle and changes in all its leaves. The plant during the stress tried to recover these stressed leaves, which was not possible. However, it presents a very peculiar phenomenon. It tried to rescue the part of leaf very close to its veins. To compensate for the absence of leaves, it gave lateral shoots, which makes it look like a bush. However, not all plants were equally lucky. Some of the plants subjected to severe stress were not so lucky. Some tried to survive, but nevertheless lost all their leaves. There were a few others that even though they sacrificed all their leaves, they still generated side shoots, which means that the plant is still alive. The amaranth plant suffered water stress that brought it to the brink of death, but it was able to escape it. In the laboratory, it is time to cut the samples to see inside their cells. The selected samples were embedded in LR white resin, which due to its hydrophilic character is widely used in immunohistochemistry assays. The samples are cut with a diamond knife to obtain very thin slices. We delimited the cutting area here in the capsule and made thin cuts on the ultramicrotome. These slices are 500 nanometers thick, allowing us to evaluate the morphology of a single cell layer. The cuts are so thin that there is no way to hold them without breaking or clumping. They must be manipulated by floating in water droplets until they reach the slide. Once on the slide, they are stained, covered, and observed under the microscope. It's day 64. The seeds have matured and it is time to harvest them. The seeds are in small urns in the panicle that must be opened to be released. The result is a mixture of seeds and remnants of the panicle.
The seeds must be thoroughly cleaned to measure plant production. The control plants produced on average 37 grams of seeds per plant, while the recovery plants produced 30 grams per plant. Water stress decreased seed yield by 19%. Although it is a significant decrease, when extrapolating to the field it would be better than losing the entire crop. But if the recovered plant had a small panicle, how did it manage to produce that amount of seed? The lateral shoots generated by the recovery plants also produced a panicle, and although they were smaller than the control, the sum of their seeds approached the production of a panicle that did not suffer water stress. The seeds produced by the control and recovered plants have identical visual appearance and density. Water stress does not seem to have affected seed quality. The amaranth plant can tolerate severe water stress and rehydrate to continue to develop and produce good quality seeds. But the research question is, what are the molecular or cellular mechanisms that allow amaranth to tolerate stress? Are oxalate crystals involved? We observed under the microscope the leaves with optical clearing and found that the number and size of crystals did not decrease. On the contrary, it increased with stress and time. The researcher's hypothesis is incorrect. On day 13 the control leaf had a moderate amount of crystals, and by day 36 they had increased. Natural leaf development increased the amount of crystals. As time progresses, plants go into senescence or cellular aging. And because the experiment was going to last a long time, we had to monitor what effect senescence would have on the crystals. On the other hand, on day 21 the stressed leaf had more crystals than the control leaf. Water stress also generated an increase in the amount of crystals. Water stress can cause premature senescence. Thus, the overaccumulation of crystals could be due to natural senescence and premature senescence. Oxalate crystals do not seem to be related to plant resistance. However, what about cellular mechanisms? This is a resin slice viewed under an optical microscope. This is the control plant on day 21. The amaranth leaf is composed of cells of epidermis, stomata, mesophyll, bundle sheath, vascular bundles, and crystal idioblasts. Inside each of these cells are different organelles and lots of water. The epidermis protects the interior of the leaf and stomata block or allow the exchange of carbon dioxide and water between the interior and exterior of the leaf. Here we see a closed stomata, and here an open one. These cells are responsible for stomatal conductance. The organelles visible in light microscopy are the chloroplasts in blue-green, with huge starch granules inside. In magenta to red are the cell walls that delimit each cell. The chloroplasts of the mesophyll are mainly responsible for the capture of sunlight. And this capacity is measured by the maximum quantum efficiency of photosystem 2. Because they are located at one end of the leaf, mesophyll cells receive the most sunlight. On the other hand, the bundle sheath chloroplasts are mainly responsible for carbon fixation and this activity is measured by net carbon assimilation. The initial result of carbon fixation is the large amount of starch granules inside these chloroplasts. These granules function as a carbon reserve. When we look closer at the slice through electron microscopy, we can see smaller organelles such as mitochondria.
The mitochondrion is the site where the cell performs cellular respiration. While the mitochondrion burns carbon, the chloroplast captures it. The positive or negative result of net carbon assimilation is a reflection of the balance between the activity of these two organelles. The crystal idioblast is the cell that is responsible for forming the oxalate crystals within its vacuole. These cells, found just halfway through the thickness of the leaf, sometimes have organelles. The resin penetrates all the cells and their organelles to hold them in place when cutting. However, the resin cannot penetrate the crystals, so it is lost during cutting leaving only a gap. This is what the cells of a leaf that has grown under optimal conditions look like. But what do cells that have undergone severe water stress look like? This is a cut of the stressed plant, also from day 21. We observe loss of turgor, disappearance of starch granules, and generalized cell plasmolysis. Plasmolysis is the contraction and deformation of the cell's organelles and usually causes cell death. What were once perfectly ordered starch-filled chloroplasts are now a green amorphous mass located in the center of the cell. During water stress, cells cannot photosynthesize. That is why they degrade their starch to obtain the carbon they need to continue growing. We expected that once the starch ran out, they would do the same with the crystals, but they didn't. Despite the severe damage, the amaranth leaf cells were able to escape death. The recovered plant leaf showed an interesting pattern. The areas close to the veins were rehydrated, while the remote areas remained dry. Water reaches the leaves through the veins. Thus, the areas close to the veins rehydrated quickly, while the areas farther away are not yet rehydrated. In between, there is a transition zone, where the rehydration process seems to be just underway. This is a section of the recovered plant, again from day 21. In the non-hydrated zone the cells are still collapsed and their interior is plasmalized. In the transition zone the cells begin to swell and regenerate their cellular contents. The green amorphous mass begins to take the form of organelles again. In the hydrated zone, the cells have completely regenerated, the chloroplasts have regained their shape, and have resumed photosynthesis as evidenced by the starch inside. On this leaf coexist life, death, and a zone in which cells are defining to which side they will belong. It is almost miraculous how a cell so devastated by drought is able to regenerate and continue its life cycle. It is like coming back from the dead. We did not imagine that we would get these results. There must be something in these cells that allows them to revive, but we don't know what it is. What is this factor that allows cells to come back from the dead? The researchers found an unexpected clue. We analyzed the location of oxalate oxidase in the leaf. We thought we would find it around the crystals, but we actually found it in the cells that are in the process of regeneration. In this analysis, the purple areas indicate the presence of oxalate oxidase. It is found mainly in cells that are undergoing regeneration. Oxalate oxidase could be participating in cell regeneration, but there must be more molecules involved. Therefore, we need to do more RNA-like analyses to better understand this molecular process. The researchers get new questions. 
They must now focus their efforts on future analyses, which will help them understand water stress resistance at the molecular level. We are extracting RNA from the leaves for further transcriptomic studies. In those we will see which genes are being expressed under the different conditions that the plants went through. We will also analyze if there is a correlation with the histological sections. Researchers have made a breakthrough in the understanding of water stress resistance in amaranth. And although their results were not as expected, they have obtained valuable information. Although the hypothesis put forward by the researchers was wrong, there are interesting results to highlight, such as histological changes, seed production yield, and particularly important, setting a precedent in the evaluation of a model of tolerance to water stress in the amaranth plant. We have heard a lot about the formidable water stress tolerance of the amaranth plant, but we really didn't realize its potential until now. Amaranth has demonstrated a high tolerance to water stress. This makes it an excellent candidate for cultivation in areas with low rainfall or as a study model to obtain information to help improve other crops. The word amaranth comes from the Greek amaranthus, which means plant that does not wither. Now I understand. I would recommend the researchers to replicate their model, increase the number of plants, so that they can have much more accurate physiological parameters which could have an impact on the decision-making of farmers. This experiment was a general approach to understand the behavior of amaranth under severe water stress conditions. With these findings, we must propose new experiments that will provide answers to each particularity that we observed. Evidence indicates that oxalate crystals are not related to water stress tolerance. The behavior of cellular organelles does seem to hold some of the clues. Researchers have pushed the amaranth plant to the limit to unlock its secrets, but the plant has been jealous of revealing them.